is, um, this is about the um, ethics and economics sort of part of the course. Um, here we see in Costa Rica, um, they <clears throat> had, um, they have some, some really cool ecosystems and they have some cool like dry uh, tropical forests and some rainforests and they have a lot of m people that come in to visit them it's called ecotourism so people will come in and see the rainforest have y'all seen like trips you can go to Costa Rica and see the rainforest I know I see them all the time um, and so uh, the forest cover has actually increased in the country because in economically it really is profitable for them to keep some ecosystems intact um, so that it can uh, bring in money that way Plus all the things like ecosystem services we had talked about, water filtration, um, pollination of crops, that kind of thing, um, that also helps. So there's where Costa Rica is, if you're not sure. Um, it's pretty close to the equator, and the equator is going to cut right through here. Um, so nice and tropical. Um, so ethics, if you don't learn anything else today, I feel like I have an obligation to tell you what ethics are, because it comes up all the time like in your actual life. Ethics are just a study of what is right and wrong, what is good and bad, and so how do you decide those things. Um, sometimes if you get in college and you get in trouble and you cheat on a paper, like you'll be investigated by the ethics committee. Like have you heard that on the news, like maybe a sports team or something like that, a coach investigated by the ethics committee. Um, some people see things uh, in different contexts, and some people think right and wrong is right and wrong no matter what. Like it's never okay to kill somebody. But a relative might be like, well, it's okay to kill somebody if they did this. So that's not a huge part of you know the test or anything, but that's just a good term to know to be like a functional human being. Um, ethical standards. You know, a lot of people just go by the golden rule. Yeah. So um, environmental ethics, and so this is where we start getting a little bit more concerned. Environmental ethics. Uh, that's where we're going to apply ethical standards to relationships between humans and non-human things. So, you know, is it okay for us to cause the extinction of a species if it helps humans? And so that would be where environmental ethics comes in, because you're not just dealing with people anymore. Um, or is it okay to clear the forest of Costa Rica um, if it's going to make jobs? And so environmental ethics takes that study of right and wrong and then it sort of um, connects it to other non-human things. Um, we already talked about these words. We talked about them a lot. Anthropocentrism, biocentrism, and ecocentrism. Anthropocentrics, uh, they're going to just really focus on humans and human needs and look at things from a human's perspective. Um, biocentrism is going to be involved in looking at all living things. And then ecocentric, um, remember um, ecosystems, um, that is going to be all living and non-living things. And so when you're looking at ecocentrism, we start to become concerned with things like air quality and water quality, not just the birds that fly in the air and the fish that live in the water, uh, or not just the people that inhabit those things. So. Uh, we did a, a lot of talking about those things earlier in the class, and so that should sort of um, just ring a bell for you. Um, so the Industrial Revolution, that's when population started to explode, and we had talked about that on Friday. Um, and so we started getting really good using our technology, and we started harnessing all the resources, and we did it very quickly, and we improved our standards of living. Uh, John Ruskin came along, and he kind of started to communicate that people really didn't appreciate nature anymore. It was just something that we were using to our, our uh, to benefit us. And the transcendentalists, this is just something from Blit class, and you probably have read some transcendentalist work. Um, they were these poets, and they were the first people to like go sit by a pond. Like there is a, a Walden Pond poem, and they're just sitting there and talking about trees and talking about water and talking about air and really uh, giving praise to just the earth and kind of chilling out and writing stuff. Um, instead of, you know, seeing it for something we can use it for, they were looking at it just for the value. I think this is so, such it's kind of bull crap. Let me tell you why. Because they wouldn't be able to sit there and not do anything beside a pond if it wasn't for the Industrial Revolution giving them the, the, their needs. Like, when we mechanized our food and our transportation and stuff, that's what gave them the opportunity to have free time. Because without industry and farming, you don't have free time because you're working the land. So kind of good. Thank you, transcendentalists. But I'm always a skeptic. And so if it weren't for the Industrial Revolution, they wouldn't have paper and pen and free time to sit there and write about those things. So um, that's probably not what your lit teacher is going to tell you about them. But they were some poets, and so they talked about... Um, this nature being the manifest manifestation of the divine. We need to experience it. So anyway, um, so John Muir, he was the founder of the Sierra Club. If you don't follow the Sierra Club on Twitter, they should, because they put good stuff up. Just a little side note there. Um, and so
so the Sierra Club and John Muir, they really, um, he embodied this preservation ethic. So there's a huge difference between the words preservation and conservation. They sound the same, but they're not the same. So um, if I'm going to preserve something, that means you're not going to touch it. No touching. You're going to leave it in its natural state, and it's going to be protected. And you're not going to use the resources. Conservation sounds like preservation, but it's not. Conservation is you just, you can touch it a little bit. <laughs> and so this is kind of, um, when we start to think about how this applies to us, preservation is going to be things like national parks. You ever go to a national park, it's like, you go to jail, you pick, pick a flower, have you seen that? Like, like, do not remove vegetation. That, that's preservation. You don't touch stuff. Um, and so there's land set aside by our government for preservation. Conservation is different. Conservation is use but wise use. And so we have national forests for, I'm serious about this, you are like, oh, the national forests is save the trees. No, no, no. We started the national forest because we were afraid of running out of timber, like we were afraid of the timber famine. And so national forests are logged on purpose, and that's why they're managed for trees. And so, but they try to do it in a, in a wise use sort of thing. So, something like a national park where you don't touch anything, no development, nothing, preservation. Conservation, that's used, but used um, in a wise way. And so, when we start to talk about, uh, excuse me, conservation, we talk about the founder of the uh, Forest Service, Gifford Pinchot. So, um, when y'all studied all these nice dead people, <laughs> sorry, true story though, um, he, um, you can kind of see his ideas still today. Like I said, he, he started the, the forest service. His ideas got that going. There. Um, and we still use it in the same way today. You can mine on national forest land. You can graze animals. And like I said, you can certainly remove timber. Uh, but you just have to have permits and stuff. So we still, like I said, we still see this these ideas from these kind of founding fathers uh, currently. Um, so, Aldo Leopold, he wrote um, the Sand County Almanac. So, and in the Sand County Almanac, there was an essay called um, The Land Ethic. And so the land ethic, what it talked about was we are no longer, here we go, we're no longer conquerors of the land. Now we're citizens of it and we need to treat it as such. Like we're not some party that's just supposed to come in and, and just take all the resources and call it ours, uh, but now we're part of the land. And so when we think about land and then the word ethic, Ethic is right and wrong, right? Ethics are right and wrong. And so we need to use uh, this view that we're part of the land when we make decisions about using the land because we're citizens of it and we kind of coexist. And so he was, uh, he was, he kind of came up with that idea of this land ethic. We're citizens of the land. We need to kind of, I don't want to say be one with it, but I'll say it, be one with it. Um, so environmental justice, and sometimes depending on the textbook, they'll even talk about environmental racism. Saw some really cool articles this weekend about environmental racism on Twitter. Like if you, I'll say it one more time. If you just use Twitter to like catch up with what your friends are doing, like do yourself a, a, a service and follow some like news people. Because mm -hmm. you're going to be like the leaders of America because you can like read and stuff. Okay, you know how to add and read and you know how to spell. These are things, I'm being honest, like let's just be, Right, so do yourself a favor and follow some like actual people too that you can learn from. Like I said, I saw some really good uh, articles this weekend about environmental racism and the water in Flint. Did y'all know there's a city called Flint and they have awful water and it had lead in it. It's causing the kids to that causes developmental delays. It causes at high levels mental retardation. Awful water. And so there was this really cool. No, it's not cool, but there was an article about environmental racism and would that even have happened if that neighborhood had been a rich white neighborhood? And of course the answer is probably no, right? And so it really tied into some things that we had already learned. So anyway, environmental justice that should be environmental justice should happen. It doesn't happen very much, but if it did. What it says is that, you know, people should be, um, 
people should be exposed to a fair and equitable amount of pollution um, re regarding um, environmental issues. So people should be treated fairly, but that doesn't happen because poor minorities, they have less money, um, and they tend to be exposed to more pollution hazards. And there's a huge gap between rich and poor um, when we're exposed to things. Because the NIMBY principle, I'm my backyard, right? And so the more affluent you are, the less likely you are to be exposed to things like this. So there's that. Um, so, yeah, so landfills and hazardous waste landfills. In the book, it talks about how those are more commonly found in black communities, and this speaks to that. Um, and then from 1948 to 1960s, the U.S. government or mining industry. Um, yeah, so the Navajo Indians, uh, they weren't protected. Um, they really weren't given information. The miners themselves suffered, suffered health effects. Um, Low-income white residents of the Appalachians. Um, they still, that area in West Virginia, Virginia, where we're doing coal mining, it is the lower income people that tend to be the coal miners, and they get things like black lung disease that can lead to death. And that whole area, they could just blow up the top of mountains, literally just blow up mountains, and then huge erosion and all kinds of uh, environmental degradation, or kind of messing up of um, this area, and it's because the, the area was not affluent, right? And so, like I said, um, well, even with hurricanes here, it's the people that are lower income that tend to get the short end of the stick. Um, economics, that's just trades of goods and services and studying how that goes, right? And so economy, social system that converts goods to services. Um, for most of human history, um, what ended up existing was a subsistence economy. Um, and so what people did was, they grew enough food to support the family, and that was it. And they didn't really, they didn't really trade or purchase goods. Um, they just grew. They lived off the land. That's subsistence agriculture. Um, a capitalist market economy is what we live in, and that's where buyers and sellers are going to interact to determine the price of things. Um, and so we're certainly not subsistence farmers. And we can thank the industrial revolution for this capitalist market economy. <laughs> um, essentially, planned economy. This would be more like China, where you have a socialist system, and the government is going to determine prices and determine uh, how things are distributed. Uh, a mixed economy, this is us, the United States. We have a free market, and we can buy and sell what we want. But the government does do things like subsidize. It does do things like tax. It does do things like um, regulate what can be sold uh, based on laws. And so we have a mixed, we have more of a mixed economy. Um, the government is, and it will intervene to get rid of things like monopolies, okay? So, that's a thing. Um, so, we had these ecosystem services, remember? Have we talked about ecosystem? We did. did have I talked to you about ecosystem? Well, if ecosystem services, in case you just need that one more time, um, this is things that the earth does for us to free. It's a uh, form of soil. Um, Plants get pollinated, water gets purified, nutrients get cycled, the climate gets regulated, waste gets um, treated. All these things uh, are done by the earth for us for free, and um, those are called ecosystem services. Um, but a, a lot of those things, they're not taken into account when we're looking at the economy. We don't really think about that. Um, so if we look at the actual view of the economy that we kind of have, that maybe you had before you started taking this class. How, if you go take Mr. C's class, right? You go hang out with Mr. C. What you have is you have um, you have goods and services, and those things are bought uh, by people, and those people work for wages, and then they can buy more stuff, and things get thrown away, um, and that's like a traditional view of the economy. Uh, when we look at the whole system, you actually can see that there are things like ecosystem services that go into play. Um, those things that the earth does for free, those are hard to put a value on. So they're not really usually considered in the price. Then, you know, that garbage from all this, that has to go somewhere. And we don't often think about that price. Um, and then the more ecosystem services with natural cycling and those natural resources and, you know, are we going to run out of them? We don't think about this outside circle. We only see this inside circle. Um, and so that's something that we need to think about. Um, so classical economics, this is that laissez-faire kind of thing um, where, like I said, if you've hung out with Mr. C, um, the market is guided by this invisible hand that will sort of, um, it will sort of decide the price of things. 
And so this is good old Adam Smith, right? Adam, oh, it's right there. I was writing it down for you. Um, lazy. Have y'all heard of the term lazy fair before? Yes. Cool. All right, so this is that guy. And so the market would be guided by this invisible hand, and then, you know, that market would reach equilibrium where price uh, and uh, be demand and supply would, would equal, and everybody would be happy. Um, that doesn't really happen. Uh, the problem is it, it really is responsible for material wealth, but it's also responsible for this inequality between rich and poor, and it promotes the use of resources because that's what you're using. Um, so if we look at supply and demand, like I had already said, this little, I'm about to tell you something that's on the test. I'm going to be real nice, okay? So this is your first test. Let's talk about this. Um, this is supply, so that's how much of whatever you're selling we have. So if we're talking about those buttons, remember we did the activity of the class buttons? This is how many buttons we have. This is how many buttons people want. That's our demand. And when they're equal, that's equilibrium. Now, um, and we had graphed that. Um, if we think about something, if we think about something like oil, that's non-renewable, as we start to run out of oil, I think in your head, you could probably, this is price over here, right? In your head, if we started to run out of oil, um, what would happen to the price? It would go up. So if we started to think about where this equilibrium line would be, uh, it would have to move up this way. Is it going to move up this way so that I have more supply? No. If I start to run out of something, uh, the, the dot is actually going to move up this way, right? Because my demand is going to rise. When you start running out of something, people, people, you, you still see the demand, right? And so when I start to run out of a renewable, uh, excuse, a non-renewable resource, you start to see this equilibrium rise up this way so that the price goes up because your demand is going to stay high, all right? Wouldn't go this way because your supply isn't increasing. That's your quantity. Are you with me on that reasoning? It's really important to be able to read graphs, but um, I, I like to kind of talk you through those things. So definitely how about supply and demand. Understand that market equilibrium is where they're equal. Um, Cost-benefit analysis. We did this when we watched the movie about of the Yangtze. Um, and so this is where you're going to actually look at uh, the benefits and, and the uh, kind of drawbacks, and then you make a decision. So it's not just making a teen chart and writing it down, but then using that information in your pluses and minuses to go ahead and decide. It's controversial, and the reason for it is you can't take into account things like ecosystem services, like waste disposal. Those things are hard to quantify. Um, and so in our, in our uh, economy, when we're looking at price, um, they don't always get considered. Um, neoclassical economics, what it thinks is, you know, if we do run out of oil, we'll come up with another another solution. And so we don't have to think about it being non-renewable. I don't know if y'all know this. is so interesting. Do y'all know why we use petroleum? And it's in a barrel that's 40, 42 gallons. Have I told you about this? So interesting. Um, so it turns out, um, do you guys know that we like almost hunted most major whale species to extinction because we wanted their blubber for oil? Do you know that's a thing? I will to tell you everything about everything fit. Well, that's where people used to have those little kerosene kind of lamps, the little lamps to rebind them. They had electricity yet. Um, and so we would kill whales, and then we would, we would melt down their blubber. And that's why, how people could see at night that they'd have a little lamp that would be ran by a whale. Well, when the whales started being hunted to extinction, some guy, I think it was in Pennsylvania, figured out that you could make kerosene from oil. Like, oil was bubbled up from the ground, like straight on Beverly Hillbillies. And he figured out that you could make lamp oil from oil instead of quails. And so they put that oil, the petroleum, they put it in whiskey barrels, which were 42 gallons each, started to sell it for lamps. And so still today, like, oil is sold in 42 gallon barrels. It never changed. And we only started using petroleum because we ran out of whales. And so I think when we run out of petroleum, sure, we'll come up with something. But, we'll, you know, what will it be? I don't know. Um, hopefully we have something nice and renewable, um, but probably not. Um, a replacement will always be found. Um, but you know, the Earth's resources are limited. So, um, this is this Asian smog cloud. It kills 1.2 million people a year. That's not an exaggeration, that's a real number. Um, and so, when we take things and we make, for example, we make a calculator. I have a little calculator on my shelf. Let me go get it. This little calculator right here. 
I got this uh, from the, the school, and they got them for a dollar piece. This calculator was a dollar. Now just go with me. This calculator was a dollar, and it was made in China. And uh, the little plastic parts were made out of oil from somewhere in Saudi Arabia. Hey. Okay. And then the metal was probably mined out in South Africa, right? And then it was assembled at a factory, and then it was put on a barge and shipped all the way across the Pacific Ocean, and then it was sold to the school. Now, you could also buy this at the dollar store. It be housed at the dollar store, and you could buy it for a dollar. Now, that cost a dollar. Think about that. Just let that soak in. How is that even possible that this only costs a dollar? Uh, with all those people that went into the, the transaction. The reason we can do that is because we externalize costs to people like in Asia that are making our crap for us. And so they don't have the Clean Air Act. That's a real law. Okay, They don't have that. And so we can get our stuff made over there by people that are underpaid, don't have health insurance, and that they don't have any kind of regulation to uh, prohibit air pollution. And that's why we can only pay a dollar for it. But, you know, this shows the real cost of it. But we don't pay for it. So uh, those are called external costs. So external costs or externalized costs, these are things that are borne by somebody not involved in the transaction. So when those people are riding their bicycles to work and they have asthma attack, they're paying the price for your dollar calculator. When they get hurt at work and they don't have insurance, they're paying the price for your calculator. Um, when we run out of oil because we've been having it way too cheap, you know, we're going to end up paying for that, but not right now. Um, it's not in that price. So anyway, uh, prices have external costs in them when we ignore uh, social, environmental, and, and the economic costs. So um, when I go and I buy milk, I bought milk yesterday. I bought it at Target. I bought organic milk for my son, and... Um, it's, it's $8 a gallon. I bought two half gallons, they were $4 a piece. So I spent $8 for a gallon of milk. And so when I buy milk or I buy anything organic, it's more expensive because the costs are not externalized. When you buy regular milk and it's only, I don't even know how much it costs, I don't buy it, but 3 or $4, right? Is that how much milk is? Something like that. It's cheaper than $8. Um, when you buy milk that's 3 or $4, those cows like never see the light of day. They're given all kinds of antibiotics and they have pus in their milk. Um, and so there's all kinds of pesticides on the land that that uh, food was grown on and so you're not paying for that milk the cow and the farmer and the land's paying for the milk when i pay eight dollars for my milk i'm paying for the milk so the costs are internalized and so they cost more when you buy something that's natural or like handmade it costs more because the costs aren't externalized to something else they're internalized to you <laughs> Did that kind of blow your mind a little bit? Sorry about that. But that's why, everybody said, why is organic food so expensive? Because you're, you're actually paying for it. The government doesn't subsidize organic food. It subsidizes, the, it subsidizes things like, uh, you know, uh, cornflakes and Doritos. That gets subsidized. And then we wonder why everybody's obese. We have a whole food, food, food unit moving on. Um, and so we like to do this as humans. We like to discount things. And that doesn't mean, like, I'm at the store and something's on sale. Discounting means that... We look at short-term costs, and we see those as more important than long-term costs. So, for example, if I went to the store, because my groceries are super hot, if I decided that, this is good, this is a good example, my groceries are probably $275, $300 a week, and I don't even eat that much meat, because it's not good for the earth, right? But um, I can pay that much money now, or like when I'm 50, I can buy my diabetes medicine. Like, I have to decide, because you're going to end up paying for it somehow. Right? And so when I, if I were to decide that pop tarts were the way to go because they're cheaper, I would pay for that with my health and I would pay for it later. So I don't like to discount. I think about those short-term costs, you know, my health, um, or excuse me, short-term costs like the price of something. That's not more important to me than my health and my long-term well-being. Okay? So that's how people are. This, have you, you know anybody that's dropped out of high school because they don't feel like doing their work? They discounted their future. They wanted now to be comfortable instead of later being comfortable. And so that's discounting. And that's humans as a species, we like to think be comfortable now. And so y'all are, are going to be the leaders of the world because you understand that your life needs to suck now so it can be all right later. That's why you got to do your homework, right? Sorry. 
<laughs> I look like I'm blowing y'all's mind right now. Um, hey, there's a guy. I've seen him on CNN like a thousand times, and he's like the affluenza team. Have you heard of the affluenza team? Some, yeah, some of y'all that have, if you don't know anything that I've said today, then by God, get some newspaper in your life, okay? Um, because you're, you're going to be grown up soon. But there's this kid, and he's called this affluenza team. But affluenza, um, he was like, they went to Mexico because they were getting away from the cops and all this. It's a long story, but affluenza means that you have a lot of money. So, um, and you don't actually, you don't really benefit from it. And so, I think... Most of America is suffering from affluenza. We go get stuff, but it doesn't make us any happier, you know? Um, so, runaway growth. <laughs> so, everything always sounds like you're going to die in here. Resources are not many in this. Okay. Um, economic development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We make stuff. All right. So, environmental economics. Environmental economics works within. Um, kind of the field of neoclassical economics where it's the plan demand. It kind of works within that and it calls for reform. And so what environmental economics says is, it's, you know, we kind of have to reduce our demand for resources and make it more uh, efficient. And so if we still are looking at supply and demand and market costs, but um, environmental economics would do something like this. Let's say that we have a problem with climate change, right? We haven't gotten to climate change yet, but like climate change is mostly caused by us burning fossil fuels, like for electricity and for driving our cars and stuff. Well, let's just say that if we made gas $8 a gallon, right? If we did that, people would use less gasoline because the price would be too high for people to really be able to hang with that. And so just by doing that, we would cut down the CO2 emissions because people would drive as much. And so we're working within the current neoclassical economic uh, kind of framework that we have, but you're, um, you're sort of changing uh, the prices and, so that we can reduce our demand. Another another example of this would be something like um, if you wanted people to have electric vehicles, are you going to do people to uh, get better faucets that wouldn't use as much water, you would um, make those things cheaper so that people would be encouraged. So you're working within the current system, but you're just, um, we typically you know, the government gives billions and with a B dollars each year to oil companies to make gas cheaper so that you feel good when you go buy gas and you vote for those 300 people that are in office again. Do you know that? There are, they, they, they profit billions of dollars a quarter, but we give them our tax dollars so that you, you like uneducated, not, I'm sorry, but like the average uneducated American when they go buy gas, they feel happy. Do you feel happy when oil's cheap? Probably right. That makes you that makes you happy. But it's only cheap because we give tax dollars that you don't see to gas companies or oil companies, so that 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 you feel good. And it makes the economy strong because um, people buy more and then it's cheaper to get stuff at Walmart. But like we're we're supporting a system that doesn't make any sense. Um, everybody's like, I wish I didn't go to school today. <laughs> um, ecological economics. This one. Um, it's not quite as important um, to me. This one just says we can't really work within the system anymore. Um, we need to have a system where we're not looking at growth. Um, but the um, the environmental economics is really it's more important. This one is everything's all connected. It's kind of like All right. So um, non -mar non market values. And so when we look at those. Uh, the cost, the market cost of things, it's really hard to put a price tag on like three and a half billion years of evolution to make a tiger. Like that's really hard to put a price tag on, you know. Um, and so how can you put a price tag on being able to go hiking or being able to study something or being able to um, go and see the Grand Canyon? How can you put a price tag on that? And so these are non-market values. And so if you're thinking about ecological economics, it's hard to consider this in a market cost. Can't put can't put a price tag on that. Um, so our Earth does about forty-eight trillion dollars of ecosystem services for us per year. Per year, think about all the water filtration, air purification, pollination. Forty-eight trillion dollars. That's that's more than the gross domestic product of all countries combined. But we can't. 
quantify that. It's hard to, and we don't put it in our price tags. Um, so here's all the ecosystem services. Here is um, nutrient cycling, uses, waste treatment, water supply, food supply, gas regulation, water regulation, recreation, raw materials, erosion, uh, pollination, soil formation, all these things the earth is doing for us for free every year. Um, gross domestic product, I don't need to talk to y'all all about that, that's e e e econ, but that's just basically um, the total amount of goods and services in a, in a dollar amount that your country is making. Um, in here, um, we kind of can talk about something that's a little bit different, this genuine progress indicator. And so instead of just looking at monetary things, it kind of takes into account the whole quality of life. And so um, education, crime rates, uh, pollution, volunteer work, that kind of thing. Um, and so just, just look at market values. Um, and so if we look at the GDP for the United States, that's our economy, if it's growing or not, right? Um, our GDP has, uh, has grown, gone up. See? See, we're making all this money. Everything's cool. But if we look at the genuine progress indicator, we think about education levels, pollution, quality of life, uh, social costs. Um, it really hasn't, it hasn't changed much since about the 1970s. So what that goes to say is the more stuff that we have hasn't made us any healthier, any happier, any more educated. Uh, full cost accounting. This is this is me. This is when you buy things like organic or equal labeled things. So if you go buy cage free eggs, they're more expensive because the cost to the animals is accounted for. Um, if you buy something like Something that's made in the United States. If you try to, I have one pocketbook that was made in the United States, and I'm not kidding. It is made out of recycled tire inner tubes, and it was $97. So, it, and the strap of it is a seatbelt from a total car. So, that really didn't cost them any materials at all. Uh, Y'all want to see this person, aren't you? Yeah. Okay, I'll bring it tomorrow. Um, but the people that made it lived in the United States, they were given health insurance and paid fairly. Like when you, I'm sorry girls, when you go buy a coach purse or whatever, like that really was made in a factory somewhere by somebody that wasn't paid well and that probably um, doesn't have health insurance and that you have all these fossil fuels going into the process of getting it to you and you're paying for the label. But I don't know how much an inner tube purse from China would cost. Um, but what I'm trying to say is when you buy quality things and you buy things that are local and things that really are produced in, a, in, a, in an ethical way, you're going to pay more for it. And so that's full count, or full cost accounting. So if you look at the whole picture. Um, market failure is when things don't cost what they should cost. So market failure is pretty much everything at the store except things that are eco-labeled. Do you know what, I say when I'm, what I'm saying when I say eco-labeled? Things like non-GMO verified, organic, um, fair trade. I have everything in my cap. I mean, I'll get... In a second, when we go on break, I'll pull some stuff out for you because everything in my cabinet is like this. So here's Fair Trade certified. Uh, most people that make chocolate, most people that grow chocolate have never eaten chocolate, and they're pretty much slave labor. Did you know that? And thank you, Hershey's. Don't buy Hershey's bar. I'm not even kidding. Um, but and I have some of this. I, I'm not even trying to fake this right now. I have, I have this right here. So. <laughs> I didn't even mean to do that. But my chocolate is fair trade certified, so these people actually got a decent living wage. Um, and so coffee and chocolate, things like that, are grown in the tropics. That makes a big difference. Um, he has some coffee right there. So anyway, that that is an example of eco-labeling. I have some eco-labels in my drawer. I'll pull them out for you. But this helps me as a consumer when I go to the store. It tells me that this was grown without pesticides. Organic tells me it was grown without pesticides. And fair trade tells me that the people that grew it were treated well, had enough money to actually not be slaves. Okay, um, kind of big deal to me. Sorry, if you buy chocolate that doesn't have these on there, you're supporting slavery. All right. So, anyways, <laughs> Hershey's is the devil. I'm so sorry. Um, sorry, Hershey's. Okay. Um, dolphins say tuna. Have you ever noticed that tuna says dolphin safe on it? Did you know that was a thing? Okay. Um, what I'll, you actually have an assignment, um, it's due by the end of the week, is to bring in something that's eco labeled and tell me about it. So, you know, I wanted to tell you about it first. Um, somebody, I think it was Madeline Tuplin, she talked about uh, dolphin safe tuna last week. 
you, if you have tuna at your house, it probably says stop and safe tuna on it can somewhere. Um, but you can like look it up. It has different kinds of uh, like nets so they don't drown. Because they you scoop right, go with me. Dolphins are mammals. They need oxygen from the air. So together with me. <laughs> All right, so, and they would scoop them up in the nets with the fish, the tuna, and so then they would suffocate because mm -hmm. they, they would get drowned, right? Because they, they would be in the net and they would, you know, not survive the, the process of being pulled under and then up. So, anyway, they, they have new ways of doing fishing for tuna to, to kill dolphins. Y'all know any of this? Okay, I'm getting paid right now, so it's fine. Um, but I want you to look up uh, an eco-label for me, whether it's organic, fair trade, um, non-GMO. I have a lot of examples. I have a lot. I'll pull some out. When, we go, when I get done with this chapter, I'll show you some examples. But that's due on Friday, and I'll get to kind of look it up for me. Um, anyway, so that's eco-labeling. It helps me as a consumer to know that um, what I'm trying to buy was ethically made. Um, sometimes... Um, Things are greenwashed. Uh, pure bottles of water or natural. Um, natural doesn't mean anything. If you buy some natural Cheetos, I'm telling you right now, that doesn't mean anything. Um, so uh, natural doesn't. It's not regulated. It's not a eco label. Have y'all seen that? And like they'll make the package brown so it looks like it's helping you. But if it just says natural, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, pure doesn't mean anything. And so they'll put this stuff with greenwashing. They'll put it in a green package or one of those like paper brown packages, and it makes you feel like it's good, but it's no different. Um, but some of the companies. Um, Thaki does a good job. Uh, Ikea does a good job. Kohl's, actually, they have a lot of stores that are powered by solar power. Starbucks, all Starbucks coffee is uh, uh, fair trade certified. So I don't have a problem with going to Starbucks. Uh, I bring my own cup there because I have a problem with like people getting cups every day. But anyway, I don't know about some Walmart. Um, triple, bottom, triple bottom line, we, wanna, we want to meet our environmental goals. Our, uh, we want to make money, of course, and then we want to have social equity. And so if we get somehow on this magical land of this Venn diagram right here, that's the intersection there is, is sustainability. Is it possible? Probably. Uh, but do we do it in them? Anthropocentric. Um, so let's talk about these little questions. Anthropocentric point of view is uh, what, Kayla? A uh, humans only. Good. Uh, which ethic holds that unspooled nature should be protected for its own uh, intrinsic value? Uh, Trey? That is, yes, preservation. So if you think protection and preservation start with a P, they both start with a P. I think that helps. Um, so next we have, uh, which, of the, which of the following is it ecosystem services? These are things that the earth is doing for us for free. Um, <laughs> Ryan? It's always all the above. There's like two times it's not, so keep on your toes. Um, which is not an assumption of neoclassical economics that can lead to environmental degradation. Uh, Sierra. Um, so that is an assumption of neoclassical economics because um, they don't take into account externalized costs. The trick here is it says not, and so... Um, Ooh, am I wrong? Yeah, I'm just, aren't they assuming that costs are just created by virus and so are not public? Hmm. Oh, instead, of, yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, long term. Okay, so resources are unlimited. That's an assumption. Long term effects are downplayed. That's an assumption. Yeah, you're right. To see, good job, Ryan. <laughs> Yay. Um, I was really looking for something more than the public. I was looking for like individual or the environment. But yeah, you're right. Um, so thank y'all. Uh, which of the following statements would be spoken by an environmental econ economic and whatever economist? Um, Jonathan. So the current, um, so that's more, so C is more ecological economist. Um, I think it's more B. This is where we're going to change the cost of things, subsidize things maybe. So do y'all agree with C? Oh, no, it's B, B, B. Yeah. Um, market equilibrium, which uh, which sets the price of a product, is reached when, oh, I want to take this one, when they equal. So, so D. Um, which conclusion can you draw from this graph? This one's a little bit harder. Ashlyn? It is B. So we're spending more money, but our lives aren't any better. Um, so let's just take our little two, three-minute break. I'll pause this. 
Alright, so chapter 7 deals with the policies and governmental things. Um, some things in here are more important than others, and I'm going to try to bring those to light for you. Um, this case study for this chapter was um, hydrofracking, or more shortly known as fracking. And so what fracking does is you have um, in this uh, layer of rock, it's usually shell, H-S, O-H-S, okay, S-H-A-L-E, not like shell, like a shell from a seashell, but S H A L E. I swear I can spell. Um, anyway, so there's going to be methane uh, tied down in here, um, and it's because the shell was made offshore uh, of the sea, but not with seashells. Um, but it, when you had little organisms, they were in this really fine grained mud, and they uh, decomposed. And they did so without oxygen, and that makes methane. And methane is natural gas. And so all that rock is really very quite deep. And so you can actually take this fracking fluid that has water, but then lots of other chemicals, like 596 other chemicals, that's a real number. Um, and you uh, put it under pressure, and you basically bust this rock open, and then the methane can be extracted. But the methane can also get into these other layers of rock and get into the aquifer where your groundwater comes from that you drink from. And so that's the mm -hmm. issue here. Um, this is a hugely uh, popular practice for getting uh, natural gas out of the ground, and it really started uh, to become popular about 10 years ago. And this is part of the reason why your gas prices, when you fill up your gas tank, they have gone down because we have <laughs> flooded the market with domestic or United States energy from fracking because we have a lot of this. Um, unfortunately, um, there are lots of um, environmental costs here. And so, <clears throat> like I, that, that's what I was trying to say, Shell. And so, it gets the gas efficiently, keeps prices low, um, and it has some benefits. You use less coal. It makes less greenhouse gases, and we're going to talk about that. We have a whole unit on energy. So, um, policy, public policy, and environmental policy. I already talked about this. This is written stuff. This is written stuff about the environment. Um, this this picture is on your test. If we look at this picture that is on your test, you can see that um, science and the private sector and citizens all go into making solutions for environmental problems um, and the government is the one that makes those policies. It's really straightforward. Um, the tragedy of the commons, we did this at the beginning of the school year or whatever, beginning of January, <laughs> block schedule, I don't know. Um, but the tragedy of the commons and so what it says, this was written by Garrett Hardin. Um, Elaine, is that some of your people? Just, is he, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, um, that's same last name. But anyway, um, resources will be overused, and so um, if they're public and shared, they're going to get overused, overexploited. Exploit means to use. Um, and so when we're talking about things that get overexploited, forest, fisheries, grazing land, um, traditional societies like the Native Americans, they were more apt to take care of things. Um, we saw that, and then we came in and saw other stuff. Um, privatization, that's ownership. Privatization works good with property, uh, land, but no one owns the ocean, no one owns the air, and so these global commons where people don't own it, so they're not likely to take care of it. Um, and so the government has to step in to help prevent this tragedy of the commons. Uh, a free rider is the reason why we need um, environmental policy. So a free rider is that kid, like if you have a class talk party, right, and then everybody's supposed to bring something, that free rider is that kid that forgets to bring his nachos for Spanish, okay, and then he wants to have some of your quesadillas and call it a day. That's a free rider. But in environmental policy, what we're going to be talking about is these are people that um, if you say, oh, let's clean up the river, uh, let's not put our um, factory uh, emissions into the river, like they would be the guy that would be like, no, I'm good, I'm going to do it anyway. Okay, so this is why we need this is why we need environmental policy. Uh, voluntary efforts are less effective than those written into law. No joke. Um, so I just talked about external costs. Those are harmful impacts worn by people not in the transaction. Um, and so if we make if we make polluters pay extra for polluting, it makes the price of the product to go up. And so then the costs are internalized. So let me write that down. The cost 
goes up because the company, and we're talking about a company, the company had to pay more to produce whatever this is, and the cost is going to go up. And so then the costs are then to be said uh, internalized. So, for example, in Cartersville, where the Budweiser plant is, they can send their wastewater to the sewage treatment plant and it gets treated. But before the sewage treatment plant will take their uh, effluent, their wastewater, they have to make sure they meet certain criteria. If they don't, um, the sewage treatment plant won't take it. And then they can't continue to do business. And so uh, because we're making them, and they have to pay the sewage treatment plant to take their water too. And so because they have to meet criteria and they have to pay the sewage treatment plant to clean their water, it costs you more or your whoever more to buy beer. But those costs are internalized, and then the water stays clean. So, um, and we, we are really good in the United States about having uh, legislation that monitors things like uh, big companies. It's individuals. Nobody's going to come and get on to you for dumping something in the Etowah today. Like, nobody monitors you. We monitor big business as well. Um, so, anyway, human behavior is very... <laughs> Um, it's it's short term. We think about short term businesses. Think about short term, and that's the biggest issue. Um, lobbying. I want to talk about lobbying. Best of interest isn't super important, but lobbying. When we have these private corporations, and it can even be like my teachers' organization, like I'm, I'm with the Georgia Science Teachers Association. Look, we have a lobbyist that we pay, and like he goes uh, to the House of Representatives and Congress and stuff, and and sits in and listens to people talk about education and puts up two cents in and we pay him. And that's cool, like lobbyists can be good if you have a good cost. Uh, a lot of times the lobbyists are from businesses and so like if I'm with the National Beef Association or whatever, like I'm going to have the interest of making cows and making cows marketable and cheap and um, profitable for me. And so they're going to sit in and they are going to convince lawmakers that maybe Things like E. coli are less important than the bottom line for their money. And so that's the real thing, by the way. That's all true. Um, so political action committees, these are going to raise money for campaigns. Um, and so this is going to help <laughs> this is going to help people get um, elected. Um, and so if you help somebody get elected, then they're going to kind of be, if you're a company and you help someone get elected, they kind of owe you, you know, and so this is a problem. Um, of the revolving door, we're going to see this when we watch, we have a movie about, uh, we're going to watch Food Inc., I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but it talks about how people that are part of the USDA, for example, the, the people that regulate our food and drugs, um, people at the USDA, a lot of them come out of private companies that make food, that make grains. And so then they're regulating the parts of the government that are in charge of that, but they just came out of that business. And so they're kind of going for business to private and private to business back and forth, and that's kind of scary. Um, so you're going to have this conflict of interest where your buddy's working over at ConAgra where you just came from. That's a big, huge food company. Um, now you're working for the USDA, and so do you want to help ConAgra or do you want to help the general public if you just... You know, if you're going to go to the Christmas party at ConAgra, maybe you're going to help them. Um, so that's a revolving door. Um, effective decisions really need to be informed by scientific research, but sometimes probably policymakers ignore science. No joke. Um, and so a lot of, I mean, your elected officials may not have good working knowledge of science. And I've seen that when I've listened to um, the presidential debates. I can't even. Um, so... Uh, legislation is made by the legislative branch. The executive branch, um, I think you know that it's going to either sign or veto stuff, but it's also going to enforce, it's also going to enforce, um, enforce legislation. And so when we talk about the USDA, we talk about the EPA, all these things are part of the executive branch. These um, executive, um, these regulatory agencies, they're part of the executive branch. So. If, I, if you don't know the legislative branches at this point, I don't know. I mean, well, come see me after class. Um, so, like I said, those regulations, and I explained this to you in class, but I'm going to explain it to you again when you made your concept map. Um, these are specific rules that help to um, make the laws 
from the legislative branch more specific. So these are going to tell the EPA or the USC who's going to monitor it, how they're going to monitor it, what levels they have to look for. And um, so that's that helps. The judicial branch, um, they help to check the constitutionality of the legislation. They're not certainly in charge of making any laws. Um, so there's what things do. Regulatory taking. This comes into play a little bit when we talk about endangered species. And so the government, I think you know this, like let's say, has anybody ever known anybody, this happened to my grandma, has anybody ever known anybody that had a house near, near an intersection or a road that got wide and they took their land and just couldn't do anything about it? That, that's regulatory taking. They have to pay you for it. They have to pay you for it, uh, for your loss of use. Um, but they can take your stuff. And so uh, when we talk about the Endangered Species Act next uh, unit, that's actually next unit, yeah. Um, if there's an endangered species on your land and you want to log trees and say the, the animal or whatever, it might be a fungus, who cares. Um, but let's say that it lives in your trees, you can't cut your trees down. Um, and the government has to pay you for your loss of use, but they can also tell you that you can't do that. So that's important um, to kind of point out and how it pertains to the environment. Um, so when we look at the environmental policy and how environmental policy uh, have gone through different waves, um, the first wave of environmental policy was this manifest destiny, kind of the whole, the whole western part of the United States is ours and let's go and like harness it and take the stuff, right? Look at this giant tree though. Look at this, this is a person. There's no big trees like that because we already chopped them all down. But, you know, people were given land and they could have it for free, but they had to agree to develop it. That didn't prove it, right? You had to prove it by farming on it. So, like, we, we gave people free land, but they had to do something to it. They had to. That's where we started. Okay, I wonder why we have a problem soon. Um, so, the Homestead Act, like I said, you can buy or settle on 160 acres of public land. General Mining Act, this, this law, this General Mining Act, People are still using this and getting land for $5 an acre. Not even kidding you. Um, just We started just working on that. Um, and so people that, yeah, we're just still doing all this. Uh, the second wave of environmental policy, we realized that we were screwing everything up and we weren't saving anything off to the side. On my test and on the AP exam, there's just like little fun facts you got to know. This is one of them. Yellowstone National Park was first national park. And so national parks came to be because we were just completely obliterating the West, developing it, mining it, farming it. And so everybody was like, well, not everybody, but we're like, hang on, wait, maybe we should just put some of this to the side and preserve it. So the national parks came to be because of that. Uh, later on, we came up with uh, wildlife refuges and forests and all this. Um, and then we started to see that those resources were exhaustible and they, they needed legal protection. So that's the second wave. First wave is, let's destroy it. Second wave was like, oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, the third wave um, is where we started to see, um, where's my Rachel Carson? There. The third wave was when we started to see that our development had negative uh, ramifications, negative consequences. Rachel Carson, totally uh, revolutionary. After World War II, that's where you came into that idea that, you know, um, you should have a picket fence and a house and two cars and, you know, a microwave and everything was going to be cool. Uh, and we were using all kinds of chemicals and pesticides, and I hate to say eco babble like that, but DDT was a big pesticide used during um, this post World War II era. And DDT, I showed you guys that on uh, Friday, they were spraying on that little, little kid for mice. Well, it's an endocrine disruptor and it keeps bird shells from thickening enough for eggs hatch. Does that ring a bell? So, DDT was um, the topic of Silent Spring that raised, this is, this is the, this is, you got to know this, okay? Um, but this is the topic of her book. And so she was the first one to come back and say, you know, some of this in, uh, modernized things that have been proven in our life, they also have negative consequences. And so um, it's called Silent Spring because all the birds were not reaching maturation and the birds were dying. So if you don't have birds in the spring, what is it? Silent Spring. There was a river in Ohio, it was so polluted, it would just randomly catch on fire, and it did it several times, the Cuyahoga River. This is where we got the Clean Water Act from. So, 
Um, and then we have the first Earth Day in 1970. So the 60s were really a time of um, this environmental awareness and then starting to do something about it. So there's the Cuyahoga River and Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson? She was just, I mean, way before her time, just revolutionary. I mean, just got to know her. She's the most important person that we study. Um, oh, for the love of God, the National Environmental Policy Act has nothing to do with the EPA. Did you, did you hear me? I'm going to say it again. It's also not an organization. It's a law. It's a piece of legislation. And it was a big deal. It was signed in 1970. And it began this modern era. And what it did was it, for the first time, required the federal government to be responsible for their own development. And it did so by requiring an environmental impact statement from the government before they started a development project. And it forced them to, envir uh, to evaluate environmental impacts of a project. And so um, citizens could come back and look at this impact statement um, and then and, and put their ideas into it and get it revised. Um, and so that was a big deal. It was the first time the federal government was held accountable for their decisions. Um, later, not related to this, the Environmental Protection Agency was formed through an executive decision uh, if not executive, excuse me, executive order by President Nixon. And so the EPA is going to monitor all these regulations from the laws. They're going to help educate the public. I don't know how that works. Um, and they're going to um, attempt to organize all this. This was not those three letters, EPA, and the EPA and NEPA, they don't stand for the same thing. They have nothing to do with each other. All right, so conventional, customary law is like, let's open the door for ladies. But that ain't thing, okay? Conventional law comes from, is another word for treaties. There is no organization in charge of the whole world. There's no precedent of everything, okay? Sorry about that. Um, and so if we want to get something done that involves those global comments, like the atmosphere, like the ocean. The only way to do that, when we cro or when we cross international borders, the only way to solve our problems is through treaties. There's two really big ones. We're going to learn these. When I say learn them, I mean like we're going to really learn them. Um, but, you know, we came up and figured out how to reduce ozone depleting uh, chemicals. And now we have this uh, Treaty of Paris going on right here, uh, the one that just happened with climate change. But the Code of Protocol is definitely something we're going to talk about with climate change. So. We'll get back to that here in a couple months. The United Nations, of course, is um, helps to organize all this stuff, but it is not in charge of the world. It is um, this group of nations that have voluntarily come together um, and try to, you know, come with treaties and do research. And um, but they're not in charge of everything. All right, the World Bank. We'll start with the World Bank. So let's give them a little head. It's all like pointy ears. And then like the mouse that's not happy. And then like the tail. And then like the pitchfork. So that's the World Bank. Okay. Um, it's the world's, it's one of the world's largest funding sources. And, okay, here's what the World Bank does. Do you remember like our nice little Three Gorgeous Dam? Okay. So the World Bank funds things like that. They fund really large projects that make money because they're big. Okay. Now, um, somewhere, let's take a country like Kenya. Kenya might need some clean drinking water. That's the thing. The World Bank will not fund local wells or local water treatment plants. They will fund one enormous dam that completely destroys ecosystems, displaces people, and uh, causes downstream not to get sediment, messes up farm communities. They will fund that. They will not fund smaller, more sustainable things. So they help with infrastructure. When I say infrastructure, if you don't know what infrastructure means, like timeout, let's talk about it. That means roads, electricity, schools, um, power lines. That's infrastructure. Okay. They fund infrastructure projects in the developing world, but they're often unsustainable, and they are more into does it turn a profit rather than is it um, environmentally positive? Okay, so anyway, <clears throat> the European Union is um, 
kind of a group of European countries. They have the euro as their money, and they, they do pretty good with environmental stuff. Their environmental regulations are much more strict than the United States, and they got a, I think they got a pretty good little thing going there. They're trying. Um, the World Trade Organization, they're a little bitty devil. We can draw them, too. They get a little bitty one. There you go. I don't know what that is. There. Just give three dots. Um, they actually, the World Trade Organization, when we have these multinational corporations like BP, uh, they make oil and oil pots for us, or um, something like, I don't know, Apple. All your, com all your companies that you recognize are multinational. They make stuff somewhere else and they ship it to a different place, right? They don't just co uh, exist in just one country, two countries. They, they are in a lot of different countries. And so the World Trade Organization helps them. And what they do, though, is they interpret some environmental laws as unfair. So there was a case where I think it was Venezuela had some oil, and the EPA had put out some new regulations for our air quality for our oil that we were going to burn in our gasoline. And the World Trade Organization said that we were being unfair to Venezuela because their oil was not up to, to snuff. And they made us buy the oil from Venezuela. So, yeah, the World Trade Organization, which we're totally part of the World Trade Organization because everything we have comes from somewhere else, um, they have the power to override our federal laws and um, call them unfair barriers to trade. So that's kind of fun, isn't it? Um, Non-governmental organizations, um, these can be positive. Um, so things like... Um, I'm trying to think... Conservation International, there's a, I think I'm saying that wrong. There's a, it's, it's, it's in a PowerPoint Next unit, um, but they go and buy land in um, developing countries and put it to the side. So this is just something that's not part of the government, and we're going to talk about a lot of these specifically. Um, globalization. Command and control, there's a lot of different ways we can go about this. Uh, command and control as far as improving the environment, this is our most common um, way of doing it. You basically do what uh, is regu uh, but regulated and commanded of you, or you get fined or have a penalty. This is actually, it's really, um, it's really effective, and that's what we do most of the time. You can also, um, kind of underlying command and control, a green tax is a tax that is given to you when you do something environmentally uh, negative. And this is part of command and control, right? This is, this is the same. Command and control, if you don't do something in command and control in your tax, that's a green tax. Um, this is used more in Europe, but not in the United States. Um, a subsidy is sort of the opposite. It's a reward program, and it's going to give you cash resources or tax breaks to encourage positive things like Renewable energy, electric cars, um, hybrids, you can get tax breaks for that. Buying solar panels for your roof, there are subsidies for that. They're not very lucrative. They don't have a lot of money to them, but they're there. Um, energy subsidies, this is the tax breaks and spending that we spend on oil in the United States. This is the subsidies for other types of renewable energy that we spend in the United States. Just let that soak in. Oh, um, we also subsidize forestry. This is your National Forest Service land that you own because it's public land. But, like, your tax money goes into keeping these roads up. So you subsidize forestry because you provide this land and this road to these people that cut your trees down and sell them to you. Sorry. Um, the General Mining Act, we're going to come back to this. Like I said, um, all these minerals are getting mined out, paid like $5 an acre for the land. And the company doesn't even have to pay you royalties. They don't have to pay you for the, the minerals they extract. We're coming back to this later. Um, permit trading. I really like permit trading. Cap and trade, kind of the same thing. Um, you create a limit on a harmful activity like carbon dioxide or climate or sulfur dioxide. And then you find, uh, you find a limit. And then you can trade your permits if you need extra. I think I have a picture of that. I don't have a picture of that. Cap and trade is the same thing, but you basically make a limit, and if you um, go over your limit, you can buy permits from other companies, like if it was a power plant and they were making too much pollution, you could sell yours. Um, we'll talk about this a lot when we get to <laughs> air.
And you can see cap and trade worked pretty well. This is sulfur dioxide. This makes acid rain. Um, and you can see that the cap and trade system worked really well. It started in 1990. Um, and it really, acid rain isn't a problem in the uh, northeast anymore like it used to be. Um, conclusion, yay. Um, I'm going to make sure we get done with this. So which of the following is not a duty of the EPA? Uh, of course, they are all duties of the EPA. Um, which of the following entities provide structure to build dams and irrigation and all that? That is the World Bank, so C. And um, like I said, there was a cabin tray put up on sulfur dioxide. What major conclusion can be drawn from this graph? Um, the permit definitely helped. Um, let's see, have they decreased by 50%? Yeah, so by more than 50%. So it works really well. This is what we should do with carbon dioxide to help with climate change. We just haven't got around to it yet. Maybe we will now. Um, let me stop the movie. Does anybody have any questions? Awesome.